Hi, everyone. This is Dorothea Hendricks, your communication coach and presentation skills. Today, we have a very special guest. Well, all my guests are special, and but and this one is no exception. Dr. Stefan Zavalin. He is known as the professional unicorn. Now, Dr. Zavalin, after losing his vision in graduate school, decided to go ahead. He finished his degree, and when he finished the degree, went out into the work world. He actually went to work in a clinic. Then he started his own business. Now, Dr. Zavalin graduated in it with a degree in physical therapy. So he started his own business. Then he wrote a book. Then he did a TEDx talk. And now, as the professional unicorn, what he does is he empowers entrepreneurs with creative communication in their business to eliminate all the competition. Now, wow, when I read to eliminate all the competition and creative communication, I went, whoo, what is that? What is that? How do you do that? How do you do that? But before we get into having Dr. Zavalin answer that, I'd like to find out, how did you become a professional unicorn? Like, who gave you that title? How did it happen? Where did it come from? Life. Um, oh, so hi, everyone. Um, it is it is absolutely phenomenal to be here. Uh the unicorn part, I've been called a unicorn for a long time in my life because I'm just different. Also, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and it has the a lot of people move to Nashville, Tennessee. So if you grow up and stay there for a while, you start being called a unicorn because it's so rare to meet anybody in Nashville that is from Nashville. Uh, I am not in Nashville anymore. But yes, that helped cultivate and nourish this idea of, Stefan, you're a unicorn. And uh, when I was starting this new business after all the physical therapy shenanigans that I know we're going to get into, I just, it felt right to say it's the unicorn. It's the unique, amazing thing that really helps people stand out. And people always said, yeah, you just stand out. And the funny part was I went, nobody's going to take you seriously. If you call yourself the unicorn in the business world, they're just going to be like, okay, this kid, he doesn't know what he's talking about. How could he? That's so unprofessional to call yourself a unicorn. Um, unless you have crazy success, a billion dollar company, those are the unicorns. But that's otherwise people don't take you seriously. So I said, how do I make this sound professional? And then I went, wait, you just said it. The professional unicorn. By definition, nobody can argue with the fact that whatever you do is actually professional. It's in the name. No arguing there. And so that's that's kind of how it started. And it's evolved to mean so much more to me because I do believe that every single person has the potential to be special. I don't believe every single person is special. And there's a distinction in that. We'll get into it later. Um, and showcasing that distinction professionally is really what I end up doing. So the professional unicorn. Oh, so interesting. So how did that emerge out of... Um, well, you went to school, you're learning, everything is about being a doctor of physical therapy. And now you're actually helping entrepreneurs. So here you're in a profession that is, I, I'm going to say fairly looks stable, looks, uh, this is acceptable. And you go and you branch off into something that looks like you say a bit, woo right? This a purple, the unicorn, the, you know, all this stuff. So how did you bridge? What? How did you move? Number one, how did you switch businesses, right? And how did you bridge to now stay in this one? Because mm -hmm. you have to make an income as well, right? So how did this work? Yeah. And that's that's a very important point that I, I would love for people to listen to. You have to make an income and that's critical. Um, I'm going to have to start way back because it does start that far back. Way back in middle school, I started really getting into videos and high school, especially the video aspect of things, because I mostly work with video content with people and helping them create videos that look like them stayed with me all through undergrad, grad school, every project we ever had in grad school while I was getting my degree in physical therapy. And they went, you have a group project. I would always go, we're making a video. Um, and the whole group would go, we don't know how to make a video. I'm like, that's fine. I do. We're making a video. Um, and it was always entertaining, hilarious people. It was always the part that people enjoyed that much more because it was different than what everybody else was going to do. That was a simple PowerPoint presentation and boring. So that stayed the entire time. And uh, my exit out of the clinic was largely due to my vision because I was just going, documentation is very, very tough. So then I started my own business where I could do things on my own at my own pace. I did the book. I did the TEDx talk. Um, book was called Sit Less. TEDx talk called Move More, Sit Less. You might be noticing a theme. And that took us to the main catalyst, which was the show. The show was titled Scared Sitless. 
And that's funny because it's a pun. Um, but the show, while it was about reducing how much we're sitting and helping implement some of these habits and techniques and educating people, it was a virtual show done through Zoom that was, uh, I had a, a green screen. I had things flying everywhere, um, things changing, music, parody songs. Uh, people got to choose their own adventure. A lot of entertainment value on top of it all, even though it was educational and the purpose was education. At the end, I didn't have a single person come up to me and say, you've really changed my mind about how much I need to sit and that movement is important. But I had a slew of people come up and say, how did you do that? What, where did you come up with all those ideas and the creativity? What is, where was all of this this whole time? And I went, okay, wake up call. Because if what you're doing in your business is not what people are praising you about, it's starting to show that that's probably not what you're actually good at uh, most of the time. You may be good at it, but maybe not great at it. And so it was, it was that, that was the wake up call. And then the bridging into it, I said, let me try this out. I took a couple dozen entrepreneurs, some I knew, some I just met on, on social media, just reached out to them. And I said, hey, can I write and create some content for you to see how this would work? You get free content. There's nothing in it for me. For me, I get just proof of concept. I did it. Those that actually made the content, implemented it, and did everything, five to 10 times more views, more likes, more engagement everywhere. So I went, ooh, this actually works. This creativity aspect of it actually works. And uh, there for a moment, I said, I'm going to be a social media marketer. And a week later, I said, dear Lord, I don't want to be a social media marketer. Uh, and I realized that what I what I really enjoyed was that piece of saying, wow, you're an amazing, interesting human. How do we take that and use the creativity of it and creatively communicate how amazing you are, meanwhile, weaving your business into all of it? And so that sort of bridged it all the way fr from middle school. And if somebody goes, yeah, that was a complete 180, one of the reasons I picked physical therapy was because of how creative the field is as well. So the creativity piece was there because unlike other doctors, I'm not just going to give you a pill. There's not a set drug that I give you. There are exercises that I have to come up and d differently mod uh, modify them to make sure that you can do them or are they appropriate for you or how do I do it? So creativity has been here all along and I've just found the right avenue for my creativity with what I do now. Wow, that is that is so it's fortunate for starters, uh, but it's also so interesting here how we can have something that is with us. The seed is there and every once in a while it wants to bloom, wants to blossom, wants to come out. Uh, and But we don't really pursue it. It just comes out periodically. And now you ended up doing something where you thought people would ask you all about physical therapy and how to improve their health. And it turns out they were interested in how you actually shared that information, the creative component. So I'll, I'll, uh, that leads me to this question. What is creative communication? So you are empowering them with creative communication. What do you mean by that? The simple answer is so it doesn't look like anybody else. Um, at the beginning in the bio, the last line is to eliminate competition. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest reasons I think that we need to get ourselves on video for many people is because nobody else can do that. There's not another business owner that can get you on video because you are unique. You are you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there, there's that piece of if the things you're putting out there, the content that you're putting out there, the way that you're communicating with people looks and feels like somebody else could do it, it's not necessarily creative and it's not unique in that way. So that also comes to emails when people do mass emails of things and you're going, this doesn't even sound like you. You obviously had somebody wrote this. This was a template. It's not, it, there's no creative point to it. So it's putting yourself into the communication, which adds the creativity piece. And it's drawing those lines between, yes, this is what I do for my business, but this is the kind of human that I am as well. So the creative communication right now is mostly how do people show up on video as themselves? The big dream of building the, the professional unicorn further and further is the idea that if somebody comes and, for example, we go, you know what would be the absolute best thing for your business is a slip and slide in the park with bubbles. Like that's like having that as an event would be the perfect thing for your business. Um, I have yet to come across a business that's an answer for, but imagine that it is uh, to that degree. 
is to getting to that point where that is the point of the communication where we can truly be so free and fun to be able to provide that communication to the specific audience. Um, and to clarify, I'm not interested in doing the slip and slide. I'm interested in us getting to the creative process of coming up with the slip and slide as the idea. All very, very fascinating. So uh, the idea of videos, more and more people are doing videos uh, mm -hmm. because they people want to see they want to see the person. Also, people in the videos want to be able to express themselves, show who they are. But, you know, I find sometimes looking a lot of, at a lot of videos, Stefan, that people want a lot more glitz. You know, they want the opener. They want the wow, the music, the this, the that. It's like their attention spans are like a fruit fly. And so I just have to keep having something pounded at me all the time. And what if that's not the person? A person just wants to be meditative or quiet, uh, just a completely different personality, but not one that has to have all kinds of flash and, and pizzazz, right? How do you do handle that if you're going to be doing a video with a person like that? It's a beautiful question because to a degree, the answer is in the question. Um, I don't think that we should be doing the pizzazz vi videos unless that is your personality to do the pizzazz videos. Because if you're saying, I don't like all of this, you are not alone. <laughs> there are other people that don't like all the flashiness and all those things. And they want somebody to just connect with them, just talk to them, just actually feel like they're a human being in that part. Now, what that means is people get really attached to this idea. I want to go viral. I'm going to have millions of views. I'm going to be world famous. Okay, then you're going to probably have to just work with the algorithm. But the amount of people that you, a lot of people say, I want to reach a million people. Mm -hmm. If you had a million clients right now, you'd be overwhelmed. You'd be like, I can't handle a million people. So do you really want to reach a million people? Or do you want to reach a couple hundred people? And that will sustain you for a very long time. For many businesses, that's the truth. So how do you find those people that you truly can connect with? And to that point of making videos, then you make content that really connects with those people. And that might just be hey, I'm just sitting here having a cup of coffee and you and I are having a chat. So that if I'm, for example, a coach, you know that when we get on a call, I'm mostly just going to be sitting here with a cup of coffee and you and I are going to have a chat and it's going to be about you. But people get disillusioned that, but I don't get views on this. I only got 200 views. If you had 200 people staring at you while you're talking in a room, you would feel like it's plenty of views. But when it comes to videos and social media, all of a sudden, it's not enough. Other people have more. But the question is, What's the impact that you're truly trying to have? And then it's getting those views to convert them. Having uh, all these people watch you is one thing, but getting business out of it is another. So it it if if I were like say right now somebody comes up to you and they've watched a couple because you're you're on I think four different platforms, and I've seen you mostly on LinkedIn and I watch your videos, which is usually they're under a minute and they're uh, you know fast paced, high powered, packed with lots of information. And you usually somewhere in the video, often at the end, will say, let's make videos together or let's uh, let's get together. Um, and if a person calls you, like, I'm going to call you right now. This is Dorothea. You know, Stefan, what can we do? How would you do a video? Can you tell me about it? What would be the first things you'd need to do know from me? And what would the process be going through right from meeting your client to wrapping up with them and having them give you rave reviews and come back again in the future? What would those steps be? Oh, strap in. Because um, there's so much to unpack. In that. But I also want to give people value to take away um, from all of this as well. So let's very quickly unpack the idea of if you were to make a video right now, and then the process that I take people through to make those at scale. Um, because that's the other part. We talked about you're in a business. You don't have hours every single day to make a video. And that's what I find is people spend an hour or two a day making one video. Like that's that's not scalable for you to run a business and do those kinds of things. Um, some of you who might be listening or have been in, the, in that whole world know the um, formula of hook story call to action. I have reframed it uh, because I, I just, I feel like that's, it's too formulaic. It's not human enough. Really what it's saying is give them a reason to watch, then give them a reason to care about what they're watching. That's the story. And then give them an action to take based on what, what they cared about. So it's much more about I'm giving you things as opposed to, I'm going to get to get views. I'm going to get so famous and get money. No, the energy there is give, 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 because that's the whole point. And as a result of you giving, 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 they're going to go, I'd like to get some more from this person that's so giving. I want to talk to them. 
So that's the general energy that we're starting out with and to give people an idea um, about those things. And that's why I like for my call to action at the end is let's make videos together because I'm saying it's a communitive thing. That call to action could be, I gave you some information, you go make a video. I feel like we made a video together because I gave you some insight. It doesn't have to be hire me. If you're looking to make more videos, get on my calendar. It's none of those things. It's let's make videos together because that's what I really want. I want people to make generally those videos. But if somebody calls me and says, I want to make videos with you, uh, then we get really into the process of it all. And my process looks a little different because I want to make it scalable for you. So the process is this. I want to highlight you as a human being. I want to make it very, very simple. And most people, it's really funny. And I know, Dorothy, you've experienced this uh, with, with speakers. When they normally speak to you, they can enunciate well, they have energy, they have emotion and passion in what they're speaking. And all of a sudden you give them a script and they go, my business is very, you're, they're a completely different person. They're robotic. It just is, it, you're like, what is this? I don't understand. Where did all of that go? Even if they write the script themselves, which you and I have worked together before and I wrote my own scripts, I was that way as well with the script writing process. Um, I just don't feel that people have time for these short form videos to write scripts, to rehearse scripts, and to really get into that kind of a place. So my process looks like this. We get on a call and we have a conversation. Yes, the conversation is very much guided of me kind of poking and prodding about you as a human being, then a little bit about your business and merging the two. And the quick formula that I use during that call is this. I want to talk about who you are, combine it with what you do, and that gives me how you and only you do it because only you are who you are and you do what you do. Uh, and that can look at something as simple as myself. So who I am as a purple that as a person that loves purple and obviously unicorns, right? So what I do is create videos. So my videos are going to be magical. I try to make a magical and fun way of creating videos. That's how I do it all. And the how is important because that's why people choose to work with me. As we work through that hour, we're having those discussions. It keeps on happening back and forth. There is no script. I'm not asking them to say something. Sometimes I'll go, that doesn't really sound like you. I think you're trying to people please and answer something wrong, but there you go. We go through that whole hour and afterwards, I just take that recording and chop it up into the clips where it actually makes sense. And those are the videos that they use because those are those human moments where I can catch it. Sometimes an um or a sigh needs to be in there to convey that emotion or that humanity. And then they use that all across the board so that people can connect not just to their business, also to their human side. And then it's over. Then they go, oh my goodness, I have so much content. I don't know what to do with it. Because we get, uh, at the very least, you get 30 videos from just that one hour. So you have you can post every single day for a month if you want to. And most people don't, but you could. And now all of a sudden, people are just flocking to you because they're going, oh my goodness, I love this version of you because it's not a version of you. It's just you. I am going to say uh, you, you you have me sold. <laughs> you have me sold. I, I, I love the way you express that. I also love your thinking behind it. And uh, there seems to be a, a fair amount of, uh, there's a casual approach that you have. And it I, because often I found, especially in my early days, my, a lot of my videos were stilted. They, they still are stilted. They haven't changed, right? Because that's, they're out there. But it's just, and it was just trying to get comfortable. Now there's more of a conversation. I guess with people, it builds after a while. And so then you have people coming back and saying, I really like that, what you did two months ago. Can we do something more again? And often running you are. So it's interesting about all these ideas and the different ways that you do things. I'm going to go back. I found something interesting on your website. You actually have, uh, it's a downloadable PDF and it's called 101 Creative Content Ideas for Entrepreneurs and Small Business Owners. So I, I did what a lot of people do. I went and I clicked and I downloaded it and you've got some great ideas in there. But what really took me for a loop was I think after I downloaded it, was it a week, a week and a half, uh, maybe two weeks, all of a sudden I get an email from you saying, Hey, you know, what idea did you use? I saw that you downloaded that. What did you like? What did you use? That's the first time I think anybody's ever followed up with a question. I mean, I know you probably do this. It's an automatic, you know, where you've got it set up, but I I haven't responded yet. So what happens if a person, a number one, they respond and they go, oh, yes, I used the idea that you had 
whatever, and they give you that idea, do you continue with them to ask them how they, how that worked or what if happened? And nobody responds. Like so far, I haven't responded yet, Stefan. So what would you do? Send me another email. How does that work then? Because that's a yeah, I would. I would definitely start a start a conversation with it more. But yeah, absolutely. Most people don't respond with an email. Uh, what I have had people do is then there is a, hey, let's just book a time to chat. Um, because many people realize at that point, very human, they go, I haven't done anything. I got this thing. I listened to the ideas. I read the ideas. They were good. I never actually filmed anything. I never took the action. And that's, I'm very action oriented, which is one of the reasons why I don't, tell people here's ideas go film and then i'll chop it up for you i go no we're sitting down right here and we're talking and i'm filming because i that's how i'm going to get you actually on camera um that's why this is more of the the free downloadable pdf but yeah then the conversation starts and you're absolutely right i want to be transparent with that 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 second email is automated um <laughs> spot on uh, <laughs> uh but i'm so glad that you read it i'm so glad that you saw it because that's um i'm glad that it works for some people because i also I, um, all right, I'm going to get on a tiny soapbox for, for the viewers. This is me. This is me t talking about the authentic uh, aspect of this, which we can talk about authenticity, by the way, because I have a really fun story in there. Um, I don't like email marketing because of the way people do email marketing, where they just spam you with sheer volume of emails. Uh, it doesn't feel like they're really written for me. It just feels like they're there to suck me in. Uh, and, and so I just, I stay away from it because I don't feel like it's truly authentic. Um, the few times I've reached out to people uh, when I'm not sure if this was just a big marketing campaign or not, they go, oh yeah, I'm so sorry. You were on the, I'm like, if you're so sorry, why did you put me on there? Cause I didn't sign up for it. You have something automatically set up for me to go in there. Um, and that's one of the things I have all of the time where I promise I'm not going to spam you with newsletters or any kind of stuff. When you sign up with me, um, you're only going to get that one follow-up email, which I think I mentioned that you get it when you sign up to get the book. <laughs> And you probably did, but I was so, uh, you know, taken with the title and I thought, oh, creative ideas. And I, uh, for entrepreneurs and small business owners, I just, I clicked on it and then I started going through it and have I done anything with it? Or, uh, you know, I'm like one of the thousands of people that probably have downloaded it and uh, I look at it and then I go, you know, I'll deal with it maybe in a couple of days. Uh, I'll be doing, look at it when I do my next video, I'll do something. Right. And of course I, then I haven't gone back, but some of those ideas are really, really great. So I, I want to thank you for that. And I really suggest to anybody, if you're looking for some creative ideas, go on to Stefan, Dr. Stefan Zavalin, the professional unicorn and download the 101 creative ideas. Now there's something I, I heard you say in a podcast. I was listening or looking at different videos and, and listening to some of uh, the podcast interviews you've done. And in one of them, you say that what you do is, or people should think about doing boring things in unboring ways. And I thought, oh, people are doing boring things. How do you do something if you're boring? How do you do it in an unboring way? And I thought, I need an example of that. So you know, can you give me an example of that, Stefan, where somebody's done something boring and then they turn around and do it in an unboring way? I think this is a, a it, it's a great question and point for especially video content of where people go, but I just sit in front of my desk all the time, right? I, there's nothing fun about what I do when people say, oh, give us a day in a life. Yeah, I just sit in front of my desk and drink coffee. How many videos of that can I make? Um, right? I'm like, okay, but how do you frame it? Because if all you truly do is sit in front of your desk and drink coffee and you do nothing else on the actual computer, uh, why haven't you left? Why haven't you stopped? Do you truly just sit there? What else? Are there thoughts that are going through your mind? What's exciting about the things that you're doing? Right. So there, there are pieces about it that excite you we want to hear about those pieces. Um, I like to use sometimes, and this is again, back to that formula of who you are plus what you do equals how you do it. Um, if there's an accountant that loves fishing, accounting, I'm sorry to any accountants listening, but you guys know, it's not the most glamorous and fun thing. People don't like <laughs> buy concert tickets for accountants. Um, but so it might be, might be considered a boring thing to do. If he loves fishing, right? And he talks about how accounting can be very similar to fishing that everything so much about it is preparation um, that you have to get the right bait you have to get the hook you have to go to the right spot at the right time tax season or whatever whatever it might be there's so many things to correlate and combine it with that you can talk about accounting in an unboring way because there's something else that you care about and are passionate about that you bring in 
and merge the two together. Mm -hmm. um, and a great example of an accountant that actually did that is the tattooed accountant. Uh, he lives somewhere, I think it's the Midwest or something, small town. There was an accountant. He had tattooed sleeves um, all the way up and he thought nobody will ever want to do business with an accountant with tattoos. Oh, well, I'm going to call myself the tattooed accountant. That's going to be my moniker and that's what I'm going to do. And people flock to him because all of a sudden, here's going to be a person. He's probably not going to judge me. He's got tattoos. If I say like, hey, I kind of had some terrible expenses here and here, the tattooed accountant is probably not going to judge me. Other accountants might, right? And so you're making something that might be considered boring, unboring by making it part of your brand, part of you, part of the things that you find exciting because you're not the only one that finds those things exciting. Interesting example. Well, you gave, uh, gave uh, different examples there, you know, of, of accountants. It's interesting. This is an aside. I used to years ago do a lot of workshops, workshops for accountants or people wanting to get their designation because public speaking was a requirement at that time. And I never found a boring accountant. I mean, they just were so interesting. And it's always amazed me. I think it's a, I think it's something that accountants have spread about themselves just so people don't, uh, don't take them to task. So I think they, they've done that themselves because they're not boring at all. So my question to you, what is it now after you're, you're working here as a professional unicorn, you help people with their videos, you're helping them be more creative, be unique, express their uniqueness. And earlier you said uh, that being, being unique, there was, now I forgot because I didn't write it down, but. Authenticity? Yes. Yes. So um, how do you. So oh. here's, I have a whole, I have a thing about authenticity and, okay. um, my my spirit was ever so slightly crushed when I heard an idea from Seth Godin um, who said authenticity is a crock because people don't really want authenticity. And I went, oh, because I think he's smart. I think he sees a lot of things in the marketing world and he's for many, many years uh, at this point. And I went, how does that, how do I make that thought make sense to me? And I've come up with this differentiation, which is authenticity versus humanity. Because authenticity, I think, is a good start. It's just not a good final destination. And I use Taylor Swift for this example because my wife loves Taylor Swift. Um, so it, it works. Imagine you got a ticket to Taylor Swift. I, I don't even know how much it costs now. They're like ridiculous. You go to the show. Taylor comes out and says, I've had a bad day. My boyfriend said something really mean to me. My throat kind of hurts. I really don't feel like singing today and performing. Thank you. Good night. Walks away, no show. That is 100% authentic. That is how Taylor Swift feels at that moment. You're not happy about that. You are you came to the show. You did all these things. Maybe you got a babysitter, whatever it might be. Flip side. Taylor comes out on stage. Says, I've had a rough day. My boyfriend says something mean to me. My throat kind of hurts. I'm going to do my best to push through that and give you the best show I can tonight. Maybe not the best show Taylor Swift has ever given, but probably the best Taylor Swift show you have gone to because for that moment and for that show, she was human. And I actually told this story in this example to um, a Swifty, as they're called, a Taylor Swift fan. And she immediately said, you know, I would sing my heart out to try to give that energy to Taylor Swift if she had said that before. The entire show, I would be belting every single word to do that. And to me, that is the big difference between authenticity and humanity and that we should be aiming for humanity and authenticity is just the starting point. Very profound. My goodness. We're talking about uh, videos, making videos, and we're getting into the philosophies of life. Oh, I mean, I, the two are combined. You can't separate really to be effective in one. You, you have to go through and be effective in the other. Uh, what do people say about you, Stefan? I hear you are, you've worked with people in physical therapy and now as a professional unicorn you're doing videos and you're a going concern right in your new business here in your entrepreneurial venture as the professional unicorn what do clients say they like about you they value most or, or appreciate what you do what have clients said i'm gonna use three words that i hear the most often fun magic or magical and creativity um, 
And those are words that I did not ask people to say, but they keep on saying, which means my branding is on point because those are the words that I use. Mm-hmm. Fun is the most used one after we record. They go, wow, that content creation, that was fun. Um, I've got 80% of people that usually say fun without me ever asking them if it was fun. They just go, that was fun, uh, which is rare to hear with making videos. Most people making videos for business, they're going, oh, I have to do that. Um, and this actually feels fun. Um, the magical side is a lot of times in my in my groups and my presentations and these other things, I want to make things a little bit more magical because I think we take some of this business stuff too seriously and it doesn't have a spark because there is something there. It doesn't mean you can't learn in the, in a magical way. Uh, so there's definitely that piece. And the creative part is uh, I have some brainstorming sessions and I have plenty of other projects where people go, I just need to borrow your brain on this. I just like the creativity and what you think of is just, it's just different. I need this on there. And so a lot of times, um, and even for, for video stuff, I had one guy that said, for example, he said, uh, I want to talk about SEO, but SEO is boring. Back to the boring and un- unboring question. But so SEO is boring. Everybody talks about it. How would I talk about it differently? Um, and I said, okay, tell me something about yourself that's, that, that, that is just different. He was like, well, I used to own a pastry shop, um, a Pakistani pastry shop. I'm like, okay, if I'm not mistaken, Pakistani pastries are very layered, like baklava and, and, and various things like that, where they're very layered. I was like, perfect. That is exactly like SEO. Because SEO, you have to refresh all the time. You can't just do it once. It's a lot of layers that have to be constantly there. But it can't be dry. You have to use sugary, syrupy, honey keywords that actually matter in between all of these layers to make it the right kind of SEO. I'm like, that's how you can talk about SEO, unlike anybody else, because you actually owned a pastry shop that made those kinds of pastries. Um, and so it's that's the creativity side. Those aren't things that I went, I'm going to sit for 10 hours and think about this. These are things that are just there for me, for the creative side. So yeah, magic, creativity, fun. You know, it's I, I could listen to you for hours. I'm going to say you, you are, you're articulate, you're engaging, uh, your word choice, and you have a, a certain amount of energy. What do you do to keep your speaking skills sharp? I mean, you probably don't think about it, but what do you do to just make sure that when you're on, you're on? And it's a it's a great question. My my mother um, has recently gotten on me, actually, largely since the TEDx talk, which once again, thank you. Uh, but more and more since then, because that really gave me the starting point uh, of the fact that I have this, I have this presence a lot of times. So we'll be in restaurants and she's like, you're really orating. You're speaking loud. I'm like, that's like, that's okay. I'm not speaking. I'm not yelling, but I'm just, I'm able to be heard. I'm I'm articulate in that sense. But that comes down to not that I'm, I'm always doing this. I'm not always doing this. Like sometimes when I'm, you know, I'm speaking to my wife, we're actually having an in-depth conversation. Yeah. There's a, there's a a lower, um, an understanding kind of tone there. But the way that I keep it sharp is one, I'm constantly making videos. I'm constantly speaking. It is a constant presence. So the skills are always needed and being ever so slightly refined every single time. And some of these stories, sorry to break illusion for anybody listening. I've told these stories many times. So it becomes that much easier to know where do I need to put the emphasis? And so I think that's the biggest thing for me is it just takes a lot of repetition. If you're not great at it at first, that's okay. Um, For the TEDx talk, I bless my wife. I practiced um, for a month and a half before the actual event. I did my talk four times every single day. And this is the part for bless my wife. She only told me after we did the full recording of the TEDx talk of how much it was driving her up the wall because she didn't want to throw me off. (laughs) But she was like, I didn't want to hear it anymore. Um, I was like, you should have told me. I would tell you to go on a walk whenever I was about to rehearse. Um, But to that point of where sometimes it just takes pure repetition. And then when you're on, you're just on. But if somebody goes, okay, but what if you're, what if you're in a really bad mood? What if you don't feel the energy? And this is where I'll just give my tiny little tips of, I do have a couple of things. Um, I listen to Disney and dance for like five minutes. Um, I didn't have to do it today because I've just been having a very energetic day, but that, that really helps me. And then recently I have been doing power posing. Um, and my favorite one I've been doing from Ted Lasso. If anybody has ever watched that one where one of the female characters raises her arms above her head and does like a big, like lion breath of, um, it's ridiculous. It's crazy, but it really, it gets you out of the, the worry and gets all the endorphins up to where you're, you're energized to do whatever it is that you do. But yeah, that's all the things yeah, that I do. That, it, uh, that reminds me, uh, of, 
of someone else that I was watching, I think uh, Anthony Robbins, Tony Robbins, quite a while ago, how he psychs himself up and keeps himself psyched, you know, before he gets onto a, a workshop. And I, exactly what you're talking about, different power poses. Amy Cuddy, I think, talks about it in in her uh, TEDx, in her TED Talk on, on body language. And it makes such a difference. I find for me, sometimes I listen to ABBA. I'll put ABBA on and I'll bounce around. And it just, for me, it just somehow elevates, changes my mood. And even if I don't feel like it, I force myself to do it. And then the change is just amazing. So I, yeah, so good good to know. It's interesting going back to that TEDx talk, because of course uh, you, you did that here in Vancouver. And I, I was so impressed with your your natural flow, the body language, how you express yourself. And it's interesting because one of the things that we talked about during the, the practice runs was practice, 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 right? And it's so obvious. You could, you know, watching the TEDx or even sitting in the audience that time when you were on stage and all the other speakers, so obvious to see where somebody has practiced that flow, that energy, and you 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 get yourself in a groove as opposed to where you somebody who hasn't practiced. It's very difficult when a person hasn't imbibed everything to actually get up on a stage and give of yourself, right? Which is and you were you were I'm I'm going to say you're wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, so for me, knowing what you were what you talked about, you know, for physical therapy, about uh, moving more and sitting less and how engaged you were in the, in the topic at that time. And, you know, then I'm, I don't know, browsing on the internet and all of a sudden I see you're a professional unicorn. And I went like, what? <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's in a way, it's, it's a move into something different, not necessarily less creative. So I have a, a, a another question here for you, like in terms of that TEDx talk, and then we'll leave the TEDx. What was it that motivated you to actually want to do a TEDx talk? This is the brilliant thing of where I, it unlocked so much for me, just the process and the journey of doing the TEDx talk that uh, there is a potential, there's, there's, arguments to be made that it was the TEDx talk that started the unlocking towards, hey, you might want to be doing videos and communication. And because I have known and I've been told so many times that I'm a performer that I just, I, and I love to, I'm not the one that shies away from the limelight. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's make it fun. I'll jump up. I'll volunteer. I'll do all of those things. And I thought, wow, I probably have to work for five years and really get renowned to ever do a TEDx talk. TEDx talk is such an unachievable thing. And then I think I was just uh, in, in networking groups. And after a while, I went, oh, there are coaches for this. Wait, this is this is doable for, it sounds like, nearly anybody. As long as you're passionate enough, you're committed enough, and you have a worthwhile cause, you can do it. Um, it's much more attainable. And so I said, let's, let's try it. Let's, I kind of, it was a trial thing of let's, let's do it. And then when I heard more and more and more, I said, yes, I'm signing up. Let's absolutely, why, let's, let's do this. Um, Cause this has been a dream for a while. And so basically it was this idea of, I was going to get to it in five years and I got to it in a year. Um, and it kind of just, just came about of saying, okay. And the reason that I say that it unlocks so many things is it also lets you feel things are possible. There are things that you may think are impossible that are way more possible than you think. Um, we haven't touched much on this, but this whole idea, the the underlying side of losing my vision in grad school, because I'm doing all of this stuff legally blind. Everybody's a blur. Dorothea to me right now is a beautiful blur audience. That's it's true. Um, I can tell with the glasses at least. But there's a piece of that there where I would go, oh, I have to do a talk where you have to memorize a script. I have to read a script. No, there's no way that I'm going to ever be able to do that. And maybe it was harder for me, but that was the reason that I practiced for a month and a half is because I knew I can't stand there with a piece of paper during rehearsals a week before the event and go, oh, I'm not sure. Let me double check where it actually is. Because of my vision, that's not accessible to me. Mm -hmm. That's what made me be better and more fluid at it because I knew I had to uh, rehearse that much. That's an amazing silver lining as opposed to where so many people might have gone, I'm blind, can't do a TEDx talk. Oh, well, that's it. I'll give up. It's impossible. Um, so, yeah. It's it's quite amazing to me because I I know that you have uh, your your vision situation that you can't see, 
And yet watching you, listening to you, and having met you and and uh, face to face, it's just impossible for me to imagine. And yet it is, it is the case, right? But you've just made yourself become so comfortable in your situation that, uh, and you just are naturally out there. You're, you're, you're just going to do it, whatever it is you want to do, that you don't let any of these things hold you back. And I think that's quite a marvel. That's, mm. that's a really, that's a tribute to yourself. And also your wife who probably keeps, you know, just pushing you from behind. <laughs> yes. Oh, she's fantastic. She is fantastic in that sense. And I will say that if somebody ever goes, I don't believe that you're blind, which that's, that's fine. Go to some of my older videos. If you really go, not even older videos, but, but some of them, you will see a lot of typos in the captions, uh, especially in the hashtags. There are a lot of typos because I don't see them. Um, and then I post them up and later people told me, and now I use more of a copy and paste thing after I've actually checked it. So it's a little less nowadays, yeah. but yeah, there are a, a lot of my things. Um, yeah. There might be typos because I don't see it. I just type it out. <laughs> oh. um, going on to your business, what advice now you've bridged from being a physical therapist into doing videos. There are probably other people watching out there who want to move, want to do something that's more in their heart, right? They, they, they want to shift, but are afraid to do it because they built up some clients in this one business. And now they're going into something that is very different. Uh, what advice could you give them? It's interesting because we were just talking about this earlier this week. I can't remember where it was, but uh, I think the advice that I want people to focus on, and we talked about this idea of being in business and actually surviving as a business owner and making money. The advice is, why are you starting the business? And the point there is, if you're starting a business just to make money and get out of your job, just so you can make money a little bit easier, that is going to look very differently in terms of the type of business and what you're going to do for your business, as opposed to you saying, I want this to be a passion project. This is my life's work and really near and dear to my heart. And that is important to understand because most of the time, what is near and dear to your heart is not going to make money nearly as quickly as if you set something up just to make money, that, that kind of where you just want to get out of a job and not rely on it as much. So go with that in mind, really figure out where, where do you want the, the passion sort of to come from? Is it from your business or is it from outside of your business? And the piece there that's important is it's not that you can't make money doing what you love. You can, from what I've seen, it's harder and takes longer not to dissuade you, but to be a little bit more realistic about it. Mm -hmm. So really to make sure what is it that you want or what the person is looking for? What are they looking for? And what really is most important to them? If somebody's interested just in the bottom line, making the buck and they're making bucks, I mean, then go ahead and make bucks. But if they, uh, and this is this is what I'm hearing from you, but if they really want to work on their passion, of course, the other thing is here really knowing what is your passion? What is this seed that's been following you or been inside of you for most of your life, right? We all have momentary passions and then they fade, right? It's like a, you know, striking a match. There it is. It lights up and then it burns out. But we're, what we're looking at are the, the passions that are deep inside that have always been there and will be there probably till you're not here anymore. Yes. The one thing that I will add um, to all of this is, so the the passion side of it, a lot of times when you're doing something that's near and dear to your heart and you're truly passionate about it and you get into the business world, you will hear so many people telling you, well, yeah, but that's just not how business is done. Oh, that's not how marketing is done. You need to be marketing like this. You need to be doing this like that. You need to be doing that. And the truth of the matter is, if it's truly a passion project, it should be done how you want it to be done. It should not be done how other people want you to do it because then it's not your passion. And it's very easy to get into the whole thing of like, yes, it's out of a funnel and this whole system. And all of a sudden the passion is gone because you're just grinding in this whole thing and you've created a job for yourself. But again, they're not wrong in saying that's what a successful business would do. It's just that your business probably is going to succeed far later. And we can get into the definitions of success. That's mm -hmm. a whole different thing. Yeah. But I want to be very clear about that is a lot of advice that you're going to get from business people is meant for a successful business, but not always a successful passion. Thanks very much for me, you know, pointing out that there is a difference here. Uh, you know, from time to time, and I'm sure you've had this yourself, we have doubts, we have fears, uh, you know, apprehensions. 
have you, what was, has, what has been your biggest fear, your biggest doubt and how did you move through it? Um, I'm not good enough. That's been, that has been instilled since childhood. It's still very much there. Uh, I think it's going to, it's one of those that will never go away. It keeps resurfacing in newer, as you climb higher, it keeps resurfacing. Am I really good enough for this uh, other thing? That, that's been the, is my, uh, is my service good enough? Are my videos actually worthwhile? Um, and one of them is just, just take the action, just fearlessly, uh, fearlessly take the action. Uh, with certain things you can't. With certain things when you're saying, is my service good enough to charge $20,000 for? Well, if my advice to you was do it for someone for free and tell them how much it's worth to them, right? That's a very hard thing to evaluate because people really don't value free nearly as much, right? To that degree, you won't put the same energy into it as, as if somebody is paying you $20,000. But that is not to say there isn't somebody else. So when I was first starting out, I, I literally talked about how I took the two dozen entrepreneurs and I was like, yo, let me do this for free. Let me prove the, the proof of concept. And yes, immediately people went, wow, this is different. I really like this. You have something here. So that's how I got across that over and over and over. Even with coaching, um, I don't like to say that I coach, but I technically have a little a bit of a coaching program for the people that go, I just want to learn how you do what you do. Um, and I, I was so like, I'm not a coach. I don't coach. What do you mean? I'm afraid to coach. But what if, what if I say something wrong? And then it came back to the thing, but do they value it? Do, do I actually feel that what I'm saying is true to me and, and package it in the right way? Um, yeah, so it's it's just the repetition. We're back to the the repetition of speaking uh, and and getting everything and sharpening the saw in that way. And back to the idea of the repetition when it comes to obstacles, when you have fears um, of jumping through them. Uh, I, I do still have a little bit of that fear of sometimes telling people that I'm blind because I think they will judge and they will go, how could he ever make good videos if he's blind? But I've gotten now to this point where there is enough evidence to where if that's the reason you don't want to work with me, I probably wouldn't have wanted to work with you anyway. And I've actually dodged a bullet in a large sense. So yeah, those are the biggest ones. Thanks. Uh, going, that's your biggest fear. What do you think is your biggest strength? Your strong, you know, your strong attribute, one ability. I'm going to cheat and say one that is disguised as many. Um, but it's also because I've said this from a young age is, uh, adaptability. Mm. Um, and I think adaptability works hand in hand with creativity in that, in that sense. It's, it's, it's finding those moments. So we moved to the United States from Russia when I was seven and, uh, I have an older brother and you can see that he, he had a harder time acclimating to the U S culture. Um, even though he was three and a half years older than I am, it's it's still a little bit older, but you know, uh, same thing with my parents. Like there's a little bit harder for me, very easy and almost very, very quickly. Granted, there's some neuroplasticity for all you ne neuroscience uh, geeks out there that happens during that age of seven, but still there's an amount of adaptability where I went, yep, I'll just figure out how to do it. I'll do it my way. We'll, we'll make it work. And that has moved through the entirety of what I do. That helps me make sure that things are fun, that things are creative and magic. Mm -hmm. Adaptability, that is a wonderful gift. That's a wonderful ability to have. Stefan, we're going to wrap up here. Is there anything, uh, do you have a two, three things? I'll give you two, three minutes if you want to plug something, uh, put a, a call for yourself out there, please. What would you like people to know? Sure. Um, Dorothy already talked about the, the book, the 101 Creative Content Ideas, if that's what you're struggling with, but I guess you're not because you'll download the book and not take the action. Um, but <laughs> which you can, that's perfectly fine. I'm across all the social medias. If you're going, I just want to see some of these videos. I just want to have some fun. Find me on social media, um, get, get some more magic fun and creativity into your life. And then, uh, I'm available to get a, a call booked with me just as an intro, just to talk about it all. Um, and then if you're going, okay, I'm bought in. I'm I'm ready to make videos. We can have that talk or you can just pick my brain for a little while. Um, all of those things are easily accessible on the website um, for us to, to start the conversation. The last thing that I'll say, and this is not even as much self-serving as, as much as it is, I want to give you all the, the power for it. We already talked about this idea of eliminating your competition. Um, if you consistently point at other people and say, I do things like that, and I am just like that business, 
then people will always see you as just a version or a subsect or a lesser than of whatever it is that you're talking about, as opposed to saying, I do things like this because this is what I believe in. You will get a lot of rejections. But for the people that say yes, it is just an incredible journey um, to that point, because then that's really where the passion meets the business. And all of a sudden, it doesn't really feel as much like work. So I strongly, strongly encourage you to find the things that you feel are truly you uh, that takes a while. It's not a, a, a switch that you can flip to be yourself. Um, it, it takes time to uncover that. But the more and more that you do, there will be some growing pains as people will start to push away. But there will be some amazing nourishing and nurturing as people come into your life that are really magical. Thank you so much, Stefan. Dr. Stefan Zavlin, the professional unicorn. Check out his website, Check Stefan out, look at some of his videos, check him out on TikTok, LinkedIn, Instagram. What other one are you on? Facebook, YouTube, Face all Facebook, of them. Facebook, YouTube, all of them. The man is everywhere because he's magic. He's magic. Thanks so much, Stefan. Thank you, everybody else, for watching. This is Dorothea Hendricks wishing you, wishing Dr. Stefan Zavlin, and wishing you mountains of success. Thank you.